All right, we're gonna move on to our next presentation, which is Avoiding Death in the Desert. Um, this will be presented by Lisa Walker. Um, Lisa began her athletic training career in 1993 when she graduated from Brigham Young University in Provo, Utah. She has worked as the head athletic trainer at Springville High School ever since. She has held numerous positions within the UATA, RMATA, and the NATA. She has provided services with the Red Cross, Australian Down Under Bull, American Football, and the 2002 Winter Olympics. Lisa began her leadership career in 1998 as the secretary slash treasurer of the UATA, moved on to become the president of the UATA, the president of the RMATA, and she continues to serve on the UATA board of directors, SMAC for UHSAA. She's also served on the NATA Secondary Schools Committee and the NATA Honors and Awards Committee, as well as the Strategic Planning Committee to prevent sudden death in secondary school athletes uh, representing the NATA. Uh, working for, with the Corey Stringer Institute, KSI, on heat safety measures and heat acclimatization, consensus statement, um, a roundtable presentation for heat safety in secondary school athletics, heat acclimatization published in the Journal of Athletic Training in April of 2021. Uh, during the pandemic, Lisa has represented athletic trainers serving on the School Health Advisory Committee for the State of Utah, as well as the COVID-19 Testing Committee. Both committees serve as an advisory group to the governor to keep our youth in school and active in Utah. She was instrumental in passing a law mandating licensure for all athletic trainers in Utah and championed concussion legislation. She helped athletic trainers gain recognition as official healthcare providers, passed mandatory heat acclimatization measures, PPE and concussion policies with the UHSAA, as well as mandatory CPR and first aid certification for all Utah coaches, and a thorough weight management system for all high school wrestlers. Lisa is a member of the UATA Hall of Fame and the RMATA Hall of Fame. She has received multiple awards with the NATA, BOC, RMATA, UATA, KSI Local Awards. So let's all welcome Lisa. Great. Okay. Good morning. Hey, so um, a, a couple of quick disclaimers. Um, one, if my glasses go back and forth, it's because my age is creating issues with what I can see at what distance. Uh, the next is I'm sleep deprived this morning, so that sleep on talk, or that talk on sleep, excuse me, was quite appropriate um, today. I had a delay in getting in. Um, and I was kind of a raw presenter when I did this a few years ago and having been away, it's probably gonna be even worse. So just bear with me, hopefully you'll get something out of it and um, we will we'll move on from there. So I, let me start with um, avoiding death in the desert, uh, the topic we came up with when uh, myself and Dr. Carl Wenig presented this a few years ago um, at a UATA uh, conference. So. Um, for, the, for the majority of our district, um, it applies, but this talk is very specific to Utah, but we'll kind of try to pull everything else in. So what do I point this at? There we go. Okay, so when it comes to Utah, most people think of Utah to be mountains and they don't think of it to be desert. It is a semi-arid to desert climate. Um, there's a lot of mountains, a lot of variety. Um, we, we have high peaks, we have amazing skiing, um, but the dry weather is really a result of the state's location in that rain shadow in the Sierra Nevadas out of California. So when I present with, uh, with Carl, we are both members of SMAC, and for those of you who are not familiar with that term, that is the Sports Medicine Advisory Committee within our state, UHSAA, which is the Utah High School Activities Association. Um, a lot of people um, think that SMAC just has ultimate control over things that happen. Um, I'm here to clarify that at least in Utah, that's not the case. And as I've 
converse with colleagues around the nation, uh, we all seem to run into the same amount of red tape. So what we do in SMAC is we monitor and evaluate current policies that apply um, to the medical needs of our athletes, or we try to come up with new things as science emerges. Um, when it comes to how it actually works, for revision and new policy, we get to recommend. And the reality is we recommend to a bunch of people who are not medical. We recommend to a bunch of administrators. And you have to talk the administrative language if you really want to get things through. Um, because then it has to go to this executive committee for a vote and for implementation. So when, when I start to present some things in here and uh, maybe my state's represented well and yours isn't or vice versa, understand that nationwide we, we've done the best we can as athletic trainers to have people in place, but we don't always um, get what we want because there are non-medical people sitting in those positions and unfortunately there's a huge political climate that takes place. Okay, so let's start off with this. Um, top causes of sudden death in athletes. Well, here's the top 10 and if we look, today we're gonna speak on heat, but we usually say, you know, heart, heat, head, when we talk about the top three. So cardiac is always gonna be a problem and I'm afraid um, in the shadows of COVID that's gonna become an even bigger issue. Um, if you've followed all things COVID with the cardiac stuff. But that's going to play a huge role as well in, uh, in the heat side of life. There's been a lot of movies that come out about uh, athletes and injuries. You're probably familiar with them if you've had the time to watch anything. Um, they're older, Will Smith with concussion. We've got Remember the Titans. Um, that little line from it, what, you need water? Water's for cowards. And unfortunately, that's the message that traditionally has gotten across. And that's how it once, once was. So as athletic trainers, we have to change that perception and we really have to get into the education side of it. Um, I'm gonna show you a video clip here um, that's very educational, it's very lengthy, so bear with it. But if you haven't seen it before, you need to see it. Uh, a lot of us use it in our high school classrooms or with our coaches and hopefully it's gonna play. Hello, I'm Dr. Douglas Costa, CEO of the Corey Stringham Institute at the University of Connecticut. The mission of KSI is to provide research, education, advocacy, and consultation to maximize performance, optimize safety, and prevent sudden death for the athlete, warfighter, and laborer. This educational video will overview best practices for the treatment of exertional heat stroke and provide step-by-step -step guidelines to minimize the long-term complications that can result if appropriate and timely care is not initiated. Exertional heat stroke is a severe condition characterized by an extremely high body temperature above 40 degrees Celsius or about 104 degrees Fahrenheit, but usually above 105 degrees Fahrenheit. Also, central nervous system dysfunction and multiple organ system failure brought on by strenuous exercise, often occurring in hot environments. EHS is a medical emergency and can be fatal if an individual's body temperature remains above 40 degrees Celsius or 104 degrees Fahrenheit for an extended period without proper treatment. An individual's status and outcome are directly related to the number of minutes the body remains hyperthermic. The prognosis spectrum ranges from survival without complications if cooling is completed within the first 30 minutes following collapse to death if cooling is significantly delayed. As time passes without appropriate cooling, the risk for long-term or permanent complications increases. Proactive measures can and should be taken to prevent heat-related illnesses. These include heat acclimatization, practice and game modifications based on environmental conditions, and ensuring proper hydration and rest. Examples of strategies to prevent heat-related illnesses include heat acclimatization, which is phasing in of activity and equipment for applicable sports over the course of seven to 14 days to promote physiological adaptations that allow the body to better cope with heat stress. Another example is practicing game modifications based on the environmental conditions, often using wet bulb globe temperature. We have guidelines for activity modifications 
include length of practice, work to rest ratios, and equipment based on the wet bulb flow of temperature. Another example is proper hydration. Monitor hydration status before, during, and after exercise. Urine color, especially in the morning, is the easiest method and the most valid for monitoring hydration and should be pale yellow in color. Adequate rest, advised to get six to eight hours of quality sleep a night to maximize exercise heat tolerance. Additionally, wear loose fitting, moisture wicking clothing. Refrain from activity when you're sick, example, fever or stomach illnesses. Use precaution when beginning new medications or supplements. And also, use precaution when returning to activity following extended breaks. Although these prevention strategies greatly reduce the risks associated with sports participation in the heat, individuals can still experience heat-related illness due to a multitude of intrinsic and extrinsic risk factors associated with these conditions. It is imperative that medical personnel and coaching staff quickly recognize and initiate appropriate care for individuals experiencing exertional heat stroke. One of the first signs you may notice in an individual experiencing heat-related illness is an obvious struggle. The athlete will not be able to keep up with the rest of the team or perform at the same intensity. Athletes that are highly motivated feel the need to prove themselves or are verbally encouraged to continue by coaches or strength and conditioning staff are more likely to push themselves to the limit, often to the point of collapse. Aside from obvious signs of struggle, an athlete suffering from a heat-related illness may experience or report a variety of signs and symptoms. Some of the common signs include vomiting, altered consciousness, disorientation, confusion or look out of it or possibly combativeness, diarrhea or staggering, decreased performance or profuse sweating. Some of the symptoms include dizziness, headache, nausea, muscle cramps, dehydration or thirst, irritability, irrational behavior, or muscle weakness. There are several important vitals that should be taken and monitored when assessing an athlete for a heat-related illness. Checking airway if the athlete is unconscious, respiratory rate, heart rate, blood pressure, and rectal temperature. Rectal temperature is the only valid measure of temperature assessment for an exercising individual in comparison to other common methods including oral, ear, and temporal assessments and allows for continuous monitoring of temperature during treatment. Rectal temperature is also an important measure because it allows clinicians to rule in or rule out exertional heat stroke. It can be difficult for clinicians to distinguish exertional heat stroke from heat exhaustion, exertional hyponatremia, concussion, or cardiac arrest without this measure. When taking a rectal temperature, position the patient on his or her side and shield for privacy using a large towel or sheet. In this video, we are using a flexible thermistor to allow for continuous monitoring. However, if you do not have one available, a standard thermometer with a rigid probe can be used. The probe should be inserted at least 10 centimeters to allow for accurate temperature assessment. The two diagnostic criteria for exertional heat stroke are rectal temperature above 40 degrees Celsius, or about 104 degrees Fahrenheit, and central nervous system dysfunction. Signs of central nervous system dysfunction include irrational behavior, irritability, emotional instability, altered consciousness, and collapse. If these criteria are present, assume the athlete is experiencing an exertional heat stroke. Call 911 and immediately begin whole body cooling via cold water immersion. When a sporting event, including practice, is taking place during warm weather, an immersion tub should be half filled with water prior to the start of activity as a precautionary measure. Additionally, three to four coolers of ice should be readily available next to the tub in the event that an athlete needs to be immediately cooled. When initiating cooling, utilizing a mesh stretcher allows easy transport of the athlete into the tub. Once the athlete is placed in the tub, place a sheet or large towel under the arms and across the chest to ensure the athlete maintains an upright position during cooling. 
To maximize cooling efficiency, the water in the tub should be continuously stirred. Since the athlete's body temperature is tremendously elevated, the boundary water surrounding the body warms up quickly. Continuous stirring ensures the cold ice water is constantly being reintroduced to the body's surface, maximizing cooling potential. I should cover the surface of the water at all times. Cold, wet towels should be constantly rotated on the major surfaces of the body that are not submerged in water, including the head, neck, arms, and legs. To streamline the treatment process, one individual should be the lead medical professional coordinating care. This is often the head athletic trainer or sports medicine director or another qualified on-site professional. An additional two to three individuals should assist with stirring the water and rotating cold, wet towels. While treatment is occurring, vital signs should be taken at regular intervals and all procedures should be documented. A common response in individuals experiencing exertional heat shock is combative behavior due to central nervous system dysfunction. This often presents as kicking, punching, yelling, or screaming. Medical personnel and assistants should be aware of this potential response and may need to call for additional help to restrain the athlete so cooling can continue. The patient will also show signs of confusion or disorientation such as repetitive questioning. Medical professionals should continue to orient the patient to his or her surroundings in order to comfort and reassure the patient during the treatment process. As the body cools, the patient's central nervous system function and behavior should improve. While treatment times may vary due to body surface area and starting temperature, rapid cooling of the patient to 38.9 degrees Celsius or about 102 degrees Fahrenheit within 30 minutes of collapse is imperative to reduce critical cell damage and organ failure. Rectal temperature is the gold standard for guiding the treatment of exertional heat stroke. No other device should be used to assess body temperature, as they often are not valid and often underestimate an individual's true body temperature. If rectal temperature cannot be measured, an approximate estimate of cooling via cold water immersion is one degree Celsius for every five minutes and one degree Fahrenheit every three minutes, if the water is aggressively stirred during this time. For example, if someone is in the tub for 15 minutes, they would cool approximately 3 degrees Celsius or 5 degrees Fahrenheit during that time. Medical staff and other personnel should always follow the cool first, transport second method if an aggressive cooling modality is readily available, such as cold water immersion. When rectal temperature reaches 38.9 degrees Celsius or approximately 102 degrees Fahrenheit, the athlete should be removed from the immersion tub and then transferred to the nearest medical facility via EMS as quickly as possible. Most medical facilities and hospitals are not equipped with supplies to aggressively cool an individual with exertional heat stroke. Medical personnel should meet with their local EMS department prior to the start of the season to discuss chain of command and treatment protocols for the top causes of sudden death in sport, including exertional heat stroke. Having a mutual understanding and a cool first transport second protocol in place can limit conflict when an emergency occurs and allow medical staff to adequately cool the patient before transferring care to EMS personnel. Once the athlete's temperature reaches 102 degrees Fahrenheit and is removed from the tub, continue to monitor rectal temperature and vital signs. The athlete should be toweled off and any excess cold, wet clothing should be removed to prevent hypothermic overshoot, where the body temperature continues to drop post-cooling due to thermoregulatory impairments. In any case where this occurs, although this may seem contradictory, you may need to use blankets and sunlight to warm the individual back to a normal temperature. Once the patient's condition has stabilized, care is transferred from the medical staff to EMS so the athlete may receive appropriate follow-up evaluation and monitoring. The guidelines presented in this video are best practice recommendations for treating exertional heat stroke. Exertional heat stroke has had a 100% survival rate when immediate cooling via cold water immersion was initiated within 10 minutes of collapse. Please use the material presented in this video to develop policies and procedures for proper prevention, recognition, and treatment of exertional heat stroke to ensure effective and timely delivery of care. For more information regarding heat illness and appropriate treatment procedures, please visit our website at ksi.ucon.edu. For the Corey Stringer Institute at the University of Connecticut, I'm Douglas Casa. Thank you very much. Okay, sorry for the poor sound quality there. Um, let's, is it ready for me to go back? 
Okay, so Corey Stringer Institute, named after uh, Corey Stringer, an offensive lineman. Um, here he's shown on the first day uh, of a practice with the Minnesota Vikings um, back in 2001, and he did die from complications of heat stroke two days later. Um, as part of that settlement, uh, his, his widow, Kelsey Stringer, um, demanded that something be done, that this be stopped, because there's way too many deaths that are occurring. And out of that, we have the Corey Stringer Institute housed on the campus of UConn. Uh, Doug Casa, um, one of our own you know, athletic trainers, he's amazing, is the CEO of the Corey Stringer Institute. And um, I, I feel really honored and privileged that um, Doug's invited me to be part of that advisory group that, that he has there. So the epidemiology, um, let's talk a little bit about, from 1995 to, to 2015, there were 61 exertional heat stroke deaths. If we break them down by setting, we had 46 occur in the high schools, 11 in college, and two amongst the professional ranks. Um, you can see that table 5.1 there. It's uh, broken down by years. Um, when we talk about road races, um, usually there's one to two uh, EHS cases per 1,000 entrants. And those road races occur all the time. Sometimes we're there and present, and you know, in some cases we're not. But it's with the number of deaths that are there, and we'll talk in more detail about these plans, but what you just saw in that video, the death from it can be prevented, absolutely. A big key comes with recognizing exertional heat stroke. Um, in Maryland, a college football player named Jordan McNair died after collapsing during a team workout. This was just in 2018, right? So, so we've had this information for a long time, but the deaths are continuing. Here's something that came out of the trial. They tried to walk him for a while after he collapsed. His head, he just barely had control over it. They were walking him across the field to get him up and moving, I guess. It was a good distance for a guy in his state to be walking, and it was away from any resource that he probably needed at the time. So again, recognition. I can tell you that um, there have been many, many questionnaires that have gone out, and since I first put this presentation together, when we get the statistics back, and I work in the high school setting, less than one-third of high school coaches even have a clue what exertional heat stroke is, let alone recognizing it. And I work in the setting where having a medical professional is not mandatory. So there's a lot of, a lot of athletes out there that have no access to medical care and those that do, are we spread so thin that we can't be there? Have we taught our coaches, our parents, and our players what it's all about and how to recognize it? Because it's key. Zach, a 16 year old, collapsed near the end of a Riverdale High School summer workout on June 29th, 2018. He died on July 10th due to complications from heat stroke. One of the players on the team, no one could get water. Some people said they were gonna walk off. The coach, he said, go ahead, walk off. You're not gonna be on the team. We know the competitive nature of athletes. This young man, to the point of death. And it happens. It really is up to us to do what we have to do as far as educating not just ourselves, but anybody who will be in the vicinity. So critical signs of exertional heat stroke. Rectal temperature of greater than 40.5. So before today, that said greater than 40. 
new research in the last few years, a lot of clinicians said, really, it's a 40.5. Um, most of us will still follow that greater than 40, but 40.5 moves that Fahrenheit up to 105. If I, I'm, not a, I'm not a Celsius person. I'm a Fahrenheit person, so I have to always kind of do the calculations. So we've gone from 104 to approximately 105. Along with that, the CNS dysfunction, um, Doug talked about it in the video. We'll go over it again. I don't think we can say it enough. Altered consciousness, coma, convulsions, disorientation, irrational behavior, decreased mental acuity, irritability, emotional instability, confusion, hysteria, and apathy. Not to make light of this, but in my setting, I get this all the time without exertional heat stroke. Right? So you have to know your athletes. You really have to know them. If you were watching in that video that Doug did, initially he was having a conversation with the athlete that he was getting ready to test and treat. So we have to watch for that level of consciousness to change. So differential diagnoses, or, or what else could it be? Right? What else could it be, and how are we going to figure it out? Well, it could be heat exhaustion, could be exertional hyponatremia, could be exertional sickling, could be a diabetic emergency, concussion, heat syncope. There's a lot of things it could be. The reality is erectile temperature is really our only valid immediate measurement for us to really try to get a grip on, is this EHS? It's the only accurate method. It's the gold standard. And it's probably not being used. Right? As medical providers, most of us probably don't even own the equipment to do it, let alone do it. So heat-related illnesses, heat cramps, those are pretty obvious, right? We get those things all the time. Involuntary spasm, skeletal muscle, usually occurs after exercise. We resolve it, have them, you know, a little more salt in your diet. Uh, we might have to massage it in the moment, rest, because you can't go on anyway. That one's pretty easy. Heat exhaustion, inability to continue to work or exercise in the heat. They'll, they typically get nauseous, they get dizzy, they get weak. That one, again, resolved with rest, restoration of fluids and electrolytes. Heat syncope, well, this is the one where they're going to pass out, right? Fainting caused by some postural pooling of blood in the legs, loss of vascular resistance. Treatment here, they pass out, we elevate their legs, they come to, they're going to go through the basic recovery. Exertional sickling, for those who are not familiar with sickling, and there's a lot of research that's done, um, the research said one in 12 African Americans would probably experience this. So I know that personally, I had that mindset of, I have very, very few African Americans that even come to the school that I work at, so I never really worried too much about it. But the more I've kind of been delving into it, it, it this, can, this can be in anybody. There's just a higher prevalence of it. Um, I'm not going to go too deep down a rabbit hole here, but um, in, in really looking it up and like, hey, why is this the case? Uh, there does appear to be some type of um, protection if an individual carries a sickle cell trait against malaria. And, you know, whatever your beliefs are, but that, that could play a little bit of a role. I have a significant number of Pacific Islanders and in looking into it, it's like, hey, they have a higher prevalence. Hispanic population, there's higher prevalence. Now, granted, not as high as the African-American prevalence, but it would be wise for you to maybe look into that and uh, try to figure out, because you need to know who these people are. I have had that athlete that sickles. And although I was told by the parent that this does not exist, I said, well, it looks like it, and it acts like it, so I'm going to treat it that way. I don't know what else it could be, but I'm going to treat it that way. And then as this athlete went off to college, a new test discovered that, in fact, that was the case. But exertional sickling um, is something that you need to, I think, 
that's, that's a whole other conversation, but I, I think you personally probably should be looking into it. It's the cramping, muscle weakness. The athlete will slump typically rather than just collapse. They're able to speak. Their muscles look and feel normal and natural, yet they seem to complain of this cramping. If we did a rectal on them, we would find their temperature to be uh, less than 103. So that screening. If you're in the college ranks, there's some screening that's done. If you're in the high school setting, uh, we don't have that luxury unless it was done at birth. These individuals need to be very, very slowly acclimatized. We're going to talk about uh, acclimatization, but these guys need to be looked after and maybe brought on a little slower. Their drills are modified. Um, I now keep oxygen with me all the time, and EMS needs to be made aware, and, and again, education. So all the different, you know, diagnoses that it could be, well, exertional heat stroke is the one that has that rectal temperature that's higher, and again, admittedly, we're probably behind on doing it, but that's really what we need. Um, when it comes to um, what else could it be on that one, we really have to rule out cardiac first. So checking of the vital signs, ruling out the cardiac, could it be concussion? You know, sure, it could be, but that rectal temperature is going to be our telltale sign. Uh, with the sickling, again, that temperature is lower. You can see that it's lower on all of them. Now, it would be amazing if everything went in this nice, predictable order, right? I try to teach my high school kids, look, we talk about heat cramps, heat exhaustion, heat stroke, but the reality is if it were classic and followed that order, it would never make it to heat stroke, right? Because the cramps shut them down. The heat exhaustion can shut them down. Unfortunately, individuals can jump straight up to heat stroke, and that's something that we need to be kind of keep in mind. So risk factors for fatal and non-fatal. Um, we won't go through this whole chart, but the reality is in 100% of the fatal cases, there was an absence of triage and their physical output or how hard they were working exceeded their level of fitness. 100% of the time. If you look at the third one there, it says sleep deprivation. So I just want to go back to that earlier talk on sleep. Sleep, sleep, sleep. It is so important. It's part of recovery. But you can see those numbers are, are pretty high. Um, so this, this is another chart that I like to refer to when I'm trying to educate coaches and parents and kids about the factors that are involved in these. So some predisposing factors, again, in the video, Doug talked about intrinsic versus extrinsic. Um, intensity level, unmatched for fitness, that's a combination, right? You're pushing too hard, but you also have somebody else out there pushing you too hard. Their hydration status, that's something that they need to do and be prepared for uh, when they come out. Um, are they acclimatized? Do they go through heat acclimatization? Uh, we're going to find that uh, the majority of these cases occur within the first 10 days. Um, the environmental conditions, that's something that's extrinsic. We'll talk about how to monitor that. Clothing and equipment, again, that's something we need to teach them about, and those, that's some of the modifications that we make when the environment um, says that it could, could be a dangerous day. Um, are they sick? I mean, how many of your athletes come to you and say, hey, I'm I'm not feeling good today, I had a fever, or I've been sick, or do they bypass you because, you know, you're going to say I shouldn't do something, and then coach is going to be mad, and I'm going to lose my spot. So again, are they, are they ill? Are they sleep deprived? Look, I, I'm just going to say we can probably assume they are, right? That's kind of a given. It's a given for not just many of us, but I can tell you at the secondary school level, uh, rarely do I find a uh, a teenager that, that gets the right amount of sleep. All right, so environmental conditions. So when you look at this, um, we're broken down into categories. Category one, category two, category three, 
And if we take a look at our states there that are represented here at this conference, um, most of us fall into more than one category. So where are you at in your state as far as your category? Where this comes into play has to do with your climate. Is it gonna be more humid? Is it gonna be more dry? Is it gonna be hotter? Is it gonna be cooler? But this is a nice handy little chart um, that has to do with what that device over there called a wet bulb globe. Uh, that one happens to be made by a company called Kestrel. It's the one that, that I personally use. But it has to do with that reading. And they make it really easy for you. And they, it, it tells you on a screen, hey, your conditions right now are in the red or they're in the orange. And with this particular unit, you can set it based off of uh, you're in category one, category two, category three. So you need to kind of understand where you're at. Now, with that being said, where I am at in Utah, I'm in a category one, but my football team opens in category two. So our first game is to head south and go where it's really hot. My team plays on a grass field. That game takes place on a turf field. And so let's not just think this is a device I use at home, at practice, but where are we headed and what are they used to? So on my campus, and I've been there a long time, you guys, I'm in my 29th year, so I have, I have amazing relationships with my coaches, but we get together and we pull the team together and say, hey, look, this is where we're headed, so if you go down there and get beat, get beat by the team, don't get beat by the heat, because as soon as we pull into town and you get off the bus, the heat is going to do a number on you. And so we try, we try to do a little bit more. So if you could pay attention to charts like this. Um, but realistically, wet bulb globe, again, is the way to go. Just like we talk about, you know, temperature rectally really is the gold standard. This wet bulb globe is the gold standard um, as far as what we do. Um, in an attempt to get this mandated that everybody's on wet bulb globe in the state of Utah, we got a little bit of pushback on, oh, here's going to be an unfunded mandate. What's it going to cost? Who's going to run it? Who's going to set it up? Who's going to be responsible? Are we liable now because we have the unit, but we don't know what we're doing? And so, again, it's a big, long conversation. I am really not good with technology. I'm old. I've got a really steep learning curve, and I can run one of these things. It's not hard. And so if you're not currently using one, I would certainly encourage you to do so. And at the end, we can take questions, and I can answer them to the best of my ability, which isn't awesome, but at least I can get you the basics. In high school, it's recommended, and in Utah, it's mandated that we go through acclimatization guidelines. They're pretty, they're pretty basic, right? You're either an equipment-laden sport or you're not. You're starting in the heat or you're not. In the beginning, when, when we were trying to write this, and, and I was working with KSI as well, you know, the, what's the first question your coach asks you? Great, I'm never going to get to practice, right? especially down in St. George. We're never going to get to practice. And it's like, yeah, 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 you can. By using this unit, by acclimatizing, and let's just make some basic modifications, right? Days one and two of practice, you can only wear a helmet. Don't, don't put the rest of the gear on. Days three through five, go ahead, put on your helmet and your shoulder pads. Days six through, six through 14, full equipment. We limited how long? Okay, how long can you go? Well, we're not going to go longer than three hours, right? We're not going to have two-a-days, right? Some of you maybe are too young, because I'm, lo I'm looking out over the audience, and there's a pretty good mix, but a lot of us go back to hell week, right? Right? Seven days of hell, and it was for us and for them. 
yeah, we can't even call it that anymore, right? Because the coaches are like, seriously, how much for two days? Oh, only one practice a day for five days. Day six, I get two. Day seven, I only get one. And so it was a learning curve for the coaches. But they have to be educated on why. You know why. And if you have the coach that gives you the argument, when I played football, right? When I played, and I go, yeah, but you're not playing anymore, right? When you played football, did you have air conditioning in your house? Right? Did you have a computer? Did you sit in there and work your thumbs out all day playing games? No, you didn't, right? And so when you start to take things and put it into context, they, at least mine, have gotten the message and gotten the memo. Do they walk out the door saying, we got a bunch of pansies on our hands? And I go, yeah, you do. And that's what you're working with, so make the adjustment. Right? Because it's because pretty much it's where we're at. But again, I won't go too deep into this, but this is the recommended guideline. Uh, I think most of your states probably have it, uh, but you're going to want to look into it. So some common misconceptions here. When it comes to exertional heat stroke, an athlete will no longer be sweating. Okay, well, they used to teach us they'll no longer be sweating, and then all of a sudden the research came out and they said, whoa, what the heck, they were still sweating. Like, yeah, that's not the case. Rectal temperature must be greater than 104. Well, now we're finding it's really probably closer to 104.5, but we still can have a problem before then. So just because we maybe did the right thing and said, hey, rectal temperature at this, we still find that we're still going to cool them anyway. We're still going to act like it's it, right? I had the kid, no, 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 he doesn't have sickle cell. And I'm like, well, it's acting like sickle cell, so I'm going to treat it like sickle cell. So if it's acting like exertional heat stroke, we're going to have you treat it like it's exertional heat stroke. Athlete must be severely dehydrated. Well, no, that's not the case either, right? Are they most likely? Sure. But can it happen in other conditions? Absolutely. Athlete can only succumb from EHS after a lengthy exercise session. No. Again, it doesn't have to be lengthy, right? It can happen early on. We saw there's a lot of predisposing factors. And I don't think medication was listed there, but medications can also be a predisposing factor. EHS can only occur in hot and humid environments. No. Is it more likely in a hot, humid environment? Sure, but it does happen in dry. Um, all athletes with EHS will become unconscious. No. If they all became unconscious, they wouldn't be able to fight us and become combative. So they don't all become unconscious. Cold water immersion will cause vasoconstriction and shivering and therefore further increase core body temperature. That's the argument you're going to get from your EMS department. Right? That's the argument they give you. No, no, no. Or the nurse that runs out and says, no, 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 you can't do this. You know what you're going to do? And it's like, you know what? This is what's required. Does it initially cause it? Sure, you might. If you're watching that temperature, their initial temperature might go up, but then it's going to come down. Right? So it's part of the process. Oral, oral, forehead sticker, tympanic, accurate representations of core body temperature. No. They severely underestimate. Right? And I don't even think we can justifiably make the transition of, well, you know, temporally it said this, and so I'm going to make that kind of manual adjustment in my head and assume. I don't think that's going to hold up in a court of law. Okay, so we need to educate on recognition. And then we need EAPs. You got to know the warning signs and symptoms. You have to know your athletes. You have to educate your coaches. That becomes time consuming and hard. Not educate your head coach. Educate your coaches, plural. All of them that are going to be there. And you need to educate your parents. So if you don't, if we're, if we're talking, I'm talking secondary schools. So if you are in the secondary school setting and you don't already have a way to educate your parents, you need to get in and you need to work to find a way to do that. So again, this, this chart here is older. It's a few years old. This is pre-COVID and I don't know what has changed, but if you take a look at that, 
heat safety measures that can save lives, cooling tubs being required, uh, heat stress monitors being required, and both. And if you look at that national map, I'm proud to say that that one blue thing that requires cooling tubs is Utah. I fought hard for that, to get that in Utah. But look, it's not in very many places, right? And only Utah at this point in time, even in our five-state district. Um, heat stress monitors, again, not in very many places. Doing both, not in very many places. So if you're working in a state that it's not represented, which you probably are, unless you're Utah-based, you probably are, or this should be updated, this slide, you need to try to help to make it happen. Right, again, I, I, that's part of why I started off with the, hey, we, we go in and we, we fight for what we think needs to happen, and then it goes to a bunch of people who aren't medical for approval, and they shoot you down, and you have got to go back. You've got to go back over and over again to try to make some of this happen. Uh, Utah's on the verge of requiring that heat stress monitor. We are almost there. We have a plan, and um, many of your states may have a plan if you're in the secondary school setting, and we can talk more about this either at the end or in our secondary school roundtables, but I'll just give you just one little tidbit of information. Uh, NFHS um, has gotten together, and we got a bunch of wet bulb globes going out state by state, nationwide, going to be given free of charge to schools to make it happen because it's that important. Okay, so we need an EAP. That's a good starting point. Not a super easy thing to do, but what's even harder is actually following it. Right, it needs to be written. It really should be signed uh, by a medical director. Every school needs to have an EAP that's venue specific. And some of your states say you have to have an EAP and they have to be venue specific and some of your states don't even address it. So find out about that one. Here's the really hard part. Reviewing it annually on your own, sure. Reviewing it annually with your coaches and actually practicing it, really rough. Again, it's, it's a slow thing but every little bit you do is helpful. It says the EAP must be reviewed and approved by a school or district administrator. Once again, there we have the administrator. And this is probably where the uh, questions typically come in this. Yeah, administrator said no rectal temperature. Right? Isn't that pretty much where we're at? And yeah, I don't have one because they won't pay for it. Yeah, I don't have one because I don't want to lose my job. I think we need to rethink our thinking on a lot of that. It does need to be specific to the venue and you need to make sure that you've addressed who is your emergency personnel. How are you going to communicate? What equipment do you have? What's your emergency medical transport? And then there needs to be some kind of a map. Unless you're in a really small place, most of your EMS providers that show up don't really know where you're at. Um, I don't know, I don't consider Springville to be a super small town, but it probably is compared to a lot of places. Um, I have one EMS provider that's gonna show up and I actually have taken some of this stuff to them. And although they know that their ultimate medical director has control, we've kind of game planned how we'll make it happen and stay within best practices. So you might consider some creative thinking and some creative conversations. If you have developed the relationship with them, that's easier to do. If you walk through the door and tell them how to do their job, they probably won't even thank you for coming. You'll go out the door, they'll shut it behind you, and the next person won't get in. So if you could try to develop some of those relationships up front, it's extremely helpful. Who needs to see it? Well, any physician that's gonna be there working with the team, athletic trainers for sure, institutional and organizational safety personnel, administrators, coaches, if you happen to have strength and conditioning staff, anybody that's gonna be involved in the process. Um, in the state of Utah, all um, coaches, again, not just head coaches, but all coaches, if you're gonna work with the kids, you're going to be first aid and CPR certified at all times. 
That's one of those other things that we push through our SMAC committee, which is, which is great. Each school gets to decide who, quote, who they get certified through. And more and more, here's what we're finding. I am certified. I went online and got it. Right? They went online, probably maybe press play if there was even a video, or quickly went through the PowerPoint, answered the questions, got their certificate electronically, and they probably would have a rough time in the moment of the emergency. So again, even if they say they have it, do they really understand it and do they really understand how to use it? Again, their relationship and knowing, knowing your coaches. All right, I'm not advancing. It won't advance. Okay, so as far as the EAP goes, an athlete's survival may hinge on how well trained and prepared athletic health care providers are for the emergency. Organizations sponsoring any of these athletic contests need to take some ownership in that EAP. Um, involving the administration, personnel, support coaches, uh, any sports medicine personnel, and it's import really important to review it and practice it annually. Back to one of those deaths. They were walking him away from the care that he needed. Right? They're walking him in the wrong direction. I'm going to say that's a staff that wasn't at least as educated as they should have been, as prepared as they should have been, as knowledgeable as they should have been, right? And, it, and it's a big job. I, I, I don't take it lightly that it's a very big job. Hopefully the sound will be better. Is an ice tub a magic bullet? All the evidence, All the evidence indicates, indicates that if someone, someone can go in one of those tubs within 10 minutes, they're going to survive the heat stroke. Dr. Dr. Doug Casa would know. He's one of the world's leading experts on heat strokes. Casa says that in the more than 2,000 cases he's tracked, ice tubs have saved athletes from heat stroke every time. More than 2,000 times with no exceptions. If it's, if it's survival, survival then, then why are kids, are kids still dying? dying? They're dying because, They're dying the, because people the people who supervise, supervise them are not taking care of them. Them. I mean, the, yeah. these are children, these are children. So, they're so they're minors. minors. So, so we have people who have, have responsibilities to take care of, and, and those people are not doing their job. Regulations for high school sports are written on a state-by-state basis. And it turns out that three out of four states don't mandate the use of ice tubs, despite their low price. What does an ice tub cost? Max, max, you know, hundred fifty dollars. Yeah. Then why the reluctance? I mean, why is not every single high school in America saying, well, this, is "This is easy and a hundred percent survivable"? Makes perfect sense. Yeah. So I ask myself that same question a lot of times, especially when we have these tragedies that keep happening. Dr. Casa knows about football tragedies. He's the head of the Corey Stringer Institute, which was founded in the wake of football's highest profile heat stroke incident, Corey Stringer's death during NFL training camp in 2001. Casa says the NFL aggressively improved its heat stroke safeguards. NFL had the death, made massive changes to try to really do the best they can to prevent the next death from happening. Could you imagine, imagine we're going to tell, tell the next the parents, parents that they didn't have a tub and, and they lost their kid for heat stroke, stroke and you're explaining it's $150 and they don't get their kid for forever after. Okay, okay. I'm going to go gonna really go fast because really apparently yeah. we've run out of time. Um, which is not going to be a bad thing to go too fast. So let's start off with the treatment. We know what it is. Cool first, transport second. You're going to get an argument from your EMS if you haven't had that conversation in advance. Again, um, secondary school people, if you come to the roundtables, I'm happy to discuss this in greater detail and answer individual questions. Remember, 100% survival if we can do this and get that body temperature down. Um, 
that, that biggest factor is that cooling period at that initial 30 minutes, is it? This is one of my girls. She was, she was not running a race on my campus. Um, she was at a neighboring school, and uh, the road race that day, and as emotional as I get about it every time, I was not there when it happened, and I'll tell you, at the end of the story, she survives. Um, but I am gonna tell you that she survived because Rory, who's sitting behind the screen, saved her life. Rory had a feeling that day that something could go wrong and spent hours hauling ice to the venue to make sure that just in case that he would be prepared. The person holding her hand with the sunglasses is my coach, who is medical as well and very much in favor of, of all these practices and so when she recognized what was going on, she took her immediately to the creek where it was cold, and they ran to get Rory, who, Rory's the big guy behind the screen, right? Rory who could just scoop her up and take her to the cold tub. So although everything wasn't exactly the way the plan is supposed to be, it all worked out because immediate recognition and immediate treatment. When it comes to the recovery side, we, we just gotta make sure their temperature gets down, right? We gotta make sure it's down and then we gotta monitor. If there had been no effective cooling that day, I have no doubt that she would not have survived. Long-term prognosis, you know, it's good if we can get on it right away, it's good. If we can't, there's issues. I told you, at the end of the day, she survives, right? And, but, but we spent a long time getting her back. And Dr. Wenig and I spent a lot of hours researching, like, well, what do we do now, right? Because we get all this advice on here's how we treat it. Here's our EAP, here's how we treat, but now what? And now the now what's are really, really blurred on what we do, and a lot of it is common sense. So returning to play, Functionally, anatomically, was she healing? It meant a lot of lab tests. Are things in order? Did she seem to be recovered? Could she do her sport-specific skills without any repercussions that were coming? Everything is very gradual. Everything is very, very um, independent and individual, similar to what we do with concussion. This takes a long time. It can take seven to 15 months. That's certainly not unheard of. And it's really a heat tolerance issue. Some of them will never tolerate heat again. It's like their thermostat is broke. And others will gradually get that tolerance back. And so we have to use common sense. This is at the end of the season. So her laying in the creek is in the beginning. She did return. She didn't return at her previous level but she did return. They're a team. They won the state championship that year. She wasn't one of the runners that produced a score, but she was there. And we, we've, got, we've got to educate, right? And we've got to take the time. I'm a little sleep deprived. I get emotional on it anyway. Um, so I apologize for that. Again, return to play recommendations, they're hard to come by. I'm happy to discuss with anybody, um, you know, privately, if you're ever stuck in that situation. The reality is we don't really have a method to stop it, but we do have a method to treat it, and we do have a method to save them. And that's really what, what we need to do. That's what we need to focus on. All right, thank you for bearing with me through the emotions and the length. Um, any questions? Yes. Rory, come step out here. 
this would be Rory who saved the day. Yeah. You can see he's a lot bigger than me. If I would have been there, it might not have happened so easy, but he could just scoop her up. Yes. Um, I'm just thinking you know, for a differential diagnosis type of thing, when I'm in the situation, I think something's happening heat related, uh, applying an, an, um, a pulse ox and rectal temperature just to kind of differentiate what's happening. Would you recommend that? Um, Absolutely. Okay. The other thing is basically if somebody's sickling, right, yes. then what would, are they going to sickle in just their calves? Are they going to sick all over? What I have found with the sickling side of it is that um, with our with our typical heat cramps, one, we can visibly see the cramp, we can feel the cramp, and it tends to be isolated. With the sickling, it's more general. So the young man that I had, he would start to feel it in his legs. He would just say, my legs are so heavy. Like, both my legs are so heavy. And so it's a more generalized, um, you can't really pinpoint exactly where it's coming from. So what I'm wondering is if we put the pulse socks on the finger, is it going to be 99? The, the you know, that one I don't have an answer to, but I'll tell you that I kept oxygen, and oxygen was very helpful for Doesn't him. Doesn't matter. Just put it on. Kind of I just put it on. If you're thinking sickling. Okay. Yes. Thank you. And I'm certainly not, a, not an expert on sickling, so please do a deeper dive into it on your own. But, yeah. Any other, any other questions? We have time for one more. Well, mine's not a question. It's more of a, I appreciate you letting people know that heat strokes do not happen in heat. Um, unlike a majority of y'all, I'm coming from the military. Um, yeah. So, ruck marching at 40 degrees, full battle rattle, all your gear, helmet, weapons, everything, I had a heat stroke. And so, in order to educate, and if you think you're hitting barriers in your state, you should try getting medical care for your military people. And I just retired, so I know what I'm talking about. And um, what I would say is, sometimes a reality check is what you need to get what you need. So when I had a heat stroke, yes, we want to cover the people, give them their decency. Damn that. I had everybody stop what they were doing, come over, I'm going to let you see, hold, and feel this thermometer I'm about to throw in the butt because you need a reality of what is going to happen to you if you don't take care of yourself. And I would always say, when you walk past me on a ruck march, I'm at your mile. I better see you drinking water or Gatorade. We had Gatorade. <laughs> but that's me protecting you, and I want to teach you to protect yourself when I'm not here. So sometimes you have to give that reality check. And oh, by the way, athletic trainers, ignorance is not an excuse. You will get sued. And a lot of people have <laughs> lost their licenses just for simple stuff of not taking care of their troops or athletes the way they should have. So that is something that you also have to consider. First, let me say thank you for your service. Much appreciated. Um, Second, I, I, I just echo everything that, that she says there. Um, I will also tell you that um, the question typically comes up about, we're not allowed to do the rectal, we can't do the rectal, I'm gonna get in trouble for doing the rectal. It's invasive, it's this, it's that. Um, d if, if something goes wrong on your watch and you didn't do it, there's a high probability that Doug or one of his colleagues is called in as uh, professional testimony, and he will testify against you if you didn't do it, but he will testify on your behalf if somebody wants to go after you for doing it. He said you can go public and tell them if anybody wants to take them to court over best practices, I will be there in their corner. And I have never known Doug to lose. So that exists. Anyway, if I can answer any further questions, secondary school session, I'm not sure exactly when it is, but it's on your thing. And we say it's secondary school roundtables, but you're all welcome to come in. Thank you very much for your time.